thank you, you guys for attending uh, this month's expert series talk. I am super excited to have Dr. Pedro Torres with us today. I've known him for a few years. Um, let's say maybe like seven, maybe. Yep, sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm really excited to be able to share the research that he's been working on. Um, so a little bit about um, Dr. Torres. Um, he attended the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras campus, where he earned a BS in environmental science after completing his undergraduate studies. He moved to Athens, Georgia to uh, pursue a PhD in ecology at the University of Georgia, where he worked with the Lu uh, Luquillo Long-Term Ecological Research Project on a project um, examining the effects of large dams on headwater streams across Puerto Rico. During his last year of uh, graduate school, he was a consortium of four facility diversity fellow at Denison University, where he worked as a visiting assistant professor of biology. This experience exposed them to small liberal arts colleges and undergraduate research, where he enjoyed and pursued further um, by accepting visiting a faculty position at Queens University of Charlotte, um, Colgate University, and Alle Allegan's College before finally landing a tenure track position at Holy Cross. Um, he also, just in case you guys want to know, he loves sports too, <laughs> as a fun fact. <laughs> um, and I also want to include that he is an amazing person. Um, all the years that I have known him, he's also been like a, a little mini mentor to me um, and have definitely learned about a lot of uh, freshwater systems along with uh, Checo, who's also here on this uh, tall um, Zoom call. Um, and so with that, I would uh, take it on Dr. Torres. <laughs> Thank you, Rita, for, for your introduction and inviting me. And thank you, everybody, for, for showing up. Uh, to what I'm gonna be presenting here today. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen, everybody can listen to me. I'm kind of like, hide all of you guys. So I can like focus on the talk and see what I'm saying. Yep, uh, good. So, good. So today I'm gonna be talking uh, a little bit about uh, a project that I started a few years ago when I was a PhD student uh, that kind of continue on. After I was done with my part of the project, I kept collaborating on it and mixing it in with most uh, some of my most recent research now as a faculty member at Holy Cross. Uh, hopefully I'll, I'll do a, a good job enough to, to link the two projects so you can see uh, what the story behind it. So the whole talk is gonna be revolving around dams, dams in Puerto Rico. And before we go into talking about dams, uh, for those of you who haven't been to the island yet, it's gonna highlight where it is. So Puerto Rico is, uh, the smaller of the higher Antilles, located in the Caribbean, right between the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. So it's basically a tiny rectangle. It's a very small island. Uh, the longest length is about like 111 miles. And the, the widest width point will be around 39 miles from, from the North Coast to the South Coast. So it's a very small island. And on top of that, it's very characterized by the topography. So as you guys can see in this map, like all this central region, let me make sure I got the laser pointer, all right. So this whole central region, those are mountains, like high elevation, very steep mountains. And one of the results of this topography and these changes in elevation over short distances is that in Puerto Rico, there's no such thing as natural lakes. So every large, Atlantic water body that you see in Puerto Rico is the result of a dam. And so it's the case that so many people live in such a tiny island that the only way to provide water for municipal supply of all these people is to create dams, basically blocking the stream channels in order to generate a large water storage. And it's so many of them that when we take into account the small area by the number of dams. So right now in Puerto Rico, there are 27 dams. In this map, uh, every single black dot represents one of the dams. And these are only the large dams. 
So these are dams that are at least uh, 20 meters in height. There are way many more uh, smaller dams, but those are usually for smaller flood, used for uh, smaller flood control and uh, small irrigation practices. So these are the ones that actually generate a reservoir, creates a lake. So there are 27 of them at the time of this publication. Uh, the Portuguese Dam, this one right here, which is an open circle, was under construction, but that was wrapped up in 2013. So there's a high density of them. Most of them were built between 1920 and 1974. And initially the main purpose for most of these was either hydropower or irrigation. So back then when agriculture was one of the main economic drivers on the island, uh, farmers needed water to water their crops. So what, uh, the easiest way to get water was to, to create this reservoir. As the economic uh, development progressed and agriculture became not the main uh, driving force around the island, most of these actually transfer to municipal supply. So even though there are structures for irrigation in, in most of them or hydropower, most of these structures are obsolete now. So most of them, like I mentioned before, are just like strictly water supply. And they are owned by different uh, government entities with the majority being by uh, the AAE. So that's the Autoridad de Energía Eléctrica. So it's the power, the local power company on the island. The other one is the AAA. So Autoridad de Acueductos y Alcantarillados. So that's the, the water supply, uh, uh, the government water supply company. And this is just like a quick look of how some of them look close by. This is actually the Tuavaca. Reservoir. This is in my hometown of Villalba, Puerto Rico. So this is the dam wall. Uh, back then, about I would say like some 50 meters or so, there's the uh, the actual spillway gate, which is not used very often in this particular reservoir. This reservoir provides uh, most of the water for Ponce, which is the biggest city in the south side of the island. So there's always enough demand that this uh, there's no risk for this reservoir to float over unless there's a hurricane or, or like a sustained uh, long storm event. So even though it is a gated dam, it doesn't use very often. This one is an interesting one. This is uh, a picture that I took a few months ago when, when we were sampling uh, for, for environmental DNA. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on in this talk. Uh, but this is the, the Pellejas Dam. Uh, this is located in Utuado, Puerto Rico. It is uh, up in the mountains, a very rural area. And it was kind of funny when we were trying to find this dam because we were asking about where we can access the, the Lago Pellejas or the Pellejas Lake. And, and the person who directed us to, to this particular site told us like, there's no such thing as a lake anymore. Like ever since the hurricane, like sedimentation basically covered what was a small reservoir, and now it's just basically still the river just flowing through it. So these used to be one of those hydropower dams. Uh, from this picture, I'm actually standing on top of the turbines, and you can see that it's pretty much obsolete. That there, there wasn't any single cable connected to to those turbines, but the dam structure is still there. So when it comes down to the effects that this creates in terms of like chemical changes, hydrological changes and biological changes, this is still uh, considered uh, a blockage in, in the river continuum. This is the newest large dam on the island. This is the Portuguese dam uh, completed in 2013. And it's the only one that from the beginning it was built with the purpose of flood control. So this dam was created in case of like large hurricanes, large sustained storms, uh, were to flood, this section of the island in Ponce will protect all the residents uh, below it. And most recently, uh, during 2017 in Hurricane Marias, you may have heard about the Guajataca Dam, because uh, this created a national emergency uh, with the sustained rains and, and all the sediment flowing through uh, the watershed during this hurricane. Uh, this dam actually was on the brink of a complete catastrophic failure. So it started cracking basically. Uh, it's a very old dam. It hasn't been like updated since its construction, but luckily the Army Corps of Engineers was able to respond really quick. Uh, they started flying choppers and creating blockages to the areas that were about to crack to 
generate a little bit of like holding the flow. And recently there was a, a multi-billion dollar uh, grant assigned to, to actually repair the structure properly in case of a future hurricane that this doesn't happen again. Now, taking a break from dams and, and starting to talk in, uh, getting a little bit more into the biology, I wanted to talk about uh, Puerto Rican biodiversity because Puerto Rico is a tropical island and, and we have a great fauna and flora, but compared to other tropical locations, we don't have like the, the super cosmopolitan flora. For example, we don't have any terrestrial mammal other than bats, native terrestrial mammals other than bats. So there's no such thing as big cats, no risk of a jaguar jumping on you if you're hiking in the forest or anything like that. We do have like a really nice diversity of birds. We have over a dozen species of Atelodactylus frogs, so the native cookies. And when it comes down to marine environments, we do have coral reefs and, and really good marine diversity. But the highlight I will say, and I'm a little bit biased here, comes when you start looking into the freshwater system. So. Just as a preview, Puerto Rico has over a dozen of like native freshwater fish, 17 different species of freshwater shrimps and a species of semi-aquatic crab, which is a very, very high diversity for such a tiny island. And not only they're pretty and they're like amazing, they're actually very important when it comes down to regulating ecosystem processes and determining how nutrients flow and how organic matter is processed and all the basic uh, ecosystem functioning. But today, the main character is going to be the 17 shrimp species. So uh, there are 17, they're split into three main families. They added with 10 species. There's only one species of Cephocarids. So that will be a uh, Cephocaris elongata and six species of polymonids. So these are the micro vacuum. These are the ones that look like standard, what people will probably recognize as like a large freshwater shrimp with the claws. So not only they are diverse, they're very important. As I mentioned before, when it comes down to the aquatic food webs, these are uh, across all three families, you can find omnivory. So you have a good combination of the tritivores who focus on eating organic matter. You have algae eaters, grazers, and other predators feeding on small animals. But it's not only about what they eat, it's mainly about how they eat it. So they are very active when it comes down to feeding and hopefully these videos are gonna work. So in here, this is an Atia species. And right now what it's doing is what is known as like grazing, or it's basically like grasping the surface of hard substrate in order to obtain the food. However, you can have the same exact species doing this thing right here. So this is filter feeding. So rather than actively <clears throat> scraping for food, if there's enough particles, if there's enough food flowing through the water column, they will just enter lazy mode and extend their chelas wait for the food to come to them. As you can see in that light in a little video, there's a particle that's gonna land right there. And that guy's just gonna go whoop, and get into his mouth. So these are very important uh, activities that they do. And not only uh, they do all these, they're also like very high when it comes down to density. In, in the rivers up in the protected forest up in El Yunque, you can find these guys in densities of up to 40 individuals per meter square across uh, different species. Another cool feature about these guys is that they're migratory. So every single one of them require access to the estuary in order to complete the life cycle. So they're amphidromous. And the way that this work is when they are adult, they live in the headwater streams. Females reproduce. They keep their eggs attached to their abdomen. The egg hatch and the larvae will passively drift all the way down to the ocean. So they don't swim yet, they're just baby shrimp larvae. They go all the way into the estuary where they get the water chemistry necessary to complete uh, their metamorphosis. They turn into post larvae, and then they crawl all the way up to the headwater streams. Once again, completing the cycle, developing into adults and doing all that feeding and all that uh, activity that helps regulate 
multiple uh, aspects of the ecosystem. And up to this point, there's been like way too many studies uh, done on these guys and, and the role that they play on ecosystem. But as a summary, we know that they are very important to control the levels of algae, organic matter, and inorganic sediment in, in stream substrates. They increase how quickly leaves decompose. They also, their predatory nature also determine who is living in different sections of the stream. So they basically determine the, the composition of insects, uh, insect larva in small streams. And they also influence the downstream transport of nutrients. So all that activity, all that feeding, all that eating results in a lot of nutrient cycling early on in the, in the headwater streams and increased transport of soluble nutrients uh, down into, into lower streams. So due to their migratory nature, now that we know that there's so many dams in Puerto Rico, if there's no such thing as a spillway discharge or any way to connect the headwaters from the downstream reaches of a dam, every time these guys are trying to make their way back into the headwater streams, they won't be able to complete their migration. And there have been a couple studies who have shown that dams completely extirpate the, the shrimp populations. So if there's no fish ladder or any kind of connection. Streams above dams do not have any shrimp population. So they're losing all that uh, important roles that these guys play in small headwater streams. And all these projects started uh, with a publication back in 98 by uh, Jeff Holmquist and collaborators. Uh, so what Jeff did, he went to Puerto Rico and he sampled uh, multiple streams above dams and he split the dams between like dams with spillways, so dams that still provide the connection to the ocean and, and dams who have no connection whatsoever and compare them to streams that did not have any dams. And what he found, no surprisingly, was that the number of shrimps here presented from his publication in the, in the y-axis, when you have an on dam stream, so this is a completely free flowing strip, was very high compared to the no discharge dam stream, which was, they were basically virtually uh, completely extirpated. There's a little bit of number there, but those are mainly legacy populations from before the dams were even built. However, streams with discharge, so those uh, dams that provide some sort of connection between the upstream and the downstream, allow for the streams to migrate. And there were like some solid populations happening because they are really good when it comes down to crawling. They're like cockroaches. They only need a little bit of flow and they will be able to climb even 90 degree angles on the dam walls, as long as there's some water to, to show them where they need to go. Uh, a few years down the road, uh, Effie Greathouse, a grad student at the time at the University of Georgia, went back to Puerto Rico and she sampled some of the streams that Holmquist described as being completely absent of shrimp and compared them once again to free flowing streams. And what she found was that Across the landscape, every time you have a dam with no connection, the chlorophyll, so the algae levels, the organic matter, and the nutrients were significantly higher. So if there's no shrimp feeding, the conditions in the stream change drastically. So that's why one way, one quick way to know if you know uh, if you're above a dam with no spillway discharge, with no connection, if you're in Puerto Rico, is just look at the substrate, look at the rocks. If you see a lot of algae, if you see mats of sediments and organic matter, that means that there's no shrimps there to clean them up. And a little bit, a uh, couple of years later, that's when I started my PhD and uh, my advisor, Dr. Catherine Pringle at the University of Georgia was really interested in following up on what Effie did and looking at more dynamic processes. So in summary, my dissertation, my dissertation project was to look into how these dynamics of dams extirpating shrimp populations affected uh, both leaf decomposition and nutrient cycling. But for today's seminar, I'm only focusing on leaf decomposition because my time is limited. So uh, to describe what I did, the first thing I identify a uh, dam stream. So that's the Rio Limon. So this is a, a small stream in Villalba, Puerto Rico, located above the Tuavaca Reservoir. 
And then the Rio Cain, which is part of the Guanajibo watershed, which is an undammed stream on the western side of the island. And uh, these were my two focal sites. They are very similar when it comes down to substrate and water uh, chemistry. They were uh, almost identical. The only difference was that the Rio Cain had like a very healthy population of shrimps of up to 25 individuals per meter square across all the species. Well, the Rio Limon had like virtually no shrimps. There were like only a couple crabs were the only decapods that you could find there. So I run uh, consumer exclusion uh, leaf decomposition experiments in this stream. So the idea was to link the presence or absence of shrimps to actual uh, decomposition rates in this stream. So the way this worked was at each stream, I had a section with seven blocks. In each block, I had packs. So leaf packs, six bundles of leaf packs attached to a copper frame. And the exclusion copper frame was attached to a fence charger. So these are the normal fence chargers that uh, ranchers use to keep cattle enclosed. So these are like literally electric fences. These were located in the riparian zone. There were cables would go into the frame in order to exclude any micro consumers for entering the leaf packs. In the other, in the control treatments, you have the exclusion frame, but it was attached to nothing. It was basically tied to a tree in order to provide the same physical conditions without the actual effect of the electricity. So the goal here was in the free flowing stream, in the undamped stream, to prevent the shrimps from entering this leaf pack to see if these decomposition rates will actually uh, be similar to the ones in streams in which they have been completely excluded. After that study was done, I wanted to see how that particular uh, uh, decomposition uh, results will extrapolate to the other streams around the island. So we had a, a basic leaf decomposition experiment with no fence chargers involved in 14 different sites, seven dams, seven on them. Uh, and they were all run simultaneously to account for any uh, environmental variation. So these are the summary results from the first experiment. So this is the exclusion. So on the left side, you have the dam stream. So remember, this is a stream where there are no streams whatsoever. They have been completely excluded. On the right side, you have the on dam stream. The light gray is the exclusion treatment. So this is the electricity treatment. The black bar represents the control treatment. So there was no significant difference in decomposition rate between exclusion and control in the dam stream. And this is what we were expecting. If leaf decomposition was regulated by something other than shrimp or a bigger consumer, we should have seen some differences here, but virtually both treatments were the same. However, in the undam stream, remember that the control treatment, this is the only treatment that actually had shrimps being able to access. Streams were present in these streams, but this is the electric treatment. So they were not going into here. And clearly there was a higher decomposition rate. So shrimp presence accelerated the rate at which these leaf packs were losing mass, therefore linking the actual process of decomposition to their presence. Then these are the results from the island-wide decomposition. Uh, here, the K represents the decay rate. So the higher the absolute value of this number means the higher decomposition, but on average, the on-dam stream had about double the uh, decomposition rate compared to the dam side. So the same trend that we found in, the, in our small focal experiments is what we're showing in which dams, eliminating shrimps, decrease decomposition rate. There was also a strong correlation between the actual biomass and abundance of shrimps within the on dam sites. So the higher the density, the more, uh, the faster the leaves were decomposing. And something strange that happened, uh, these are the results from the dam sites. So these are the sites in which there was no shrimps whatsoever. And this is the average for the on dam sign, 0 0.0264. And there was one site, Naranjo, as part of the Luqueti uh, Reservoir Watershed, 
in which the decomposition rate was almost as fast as shrimps with uh, shrimps present. So we're curious about this site and we look a little bit closer into the samples and what was happening there. And what we found out was that this site has the highest abundance of phylocus, which is a shredding caddis fly. So this is a small invertebrate larvae who basically just eats leaves, but not only eat leaves, but they also use leaves to build their own personal cases. So these guys were getting into my leaf packs and cutting these whole chunks of leaves in order to create the litter cases. And that's why the decomposition rates were driving, uh, they were driving the decomposition rate at this particular site. And it just so happens that this was the only site that had a uh, significantly higher abundance and biomass of these guys too. Now, when it comes down to, are they analogous to shrimp? Is this like a case of functional redundancy? Well, they're only taking up this chunk of leaves and using it to build their case. So it's still a big chunk of leaf. It still represents decomposition for the leaf pack itself. But when it comes down from an ecosystem perspective, the leaf material is still there. It's still a large size to be considered quartz particular organic matter. So in theory, they're not playing the same role that the shrimps will normally play. So, so we exclude the possibility. Also, they're very patchy. So they normally are located when there's like big bundles of leaves and they uh, their abundance is very variable across the year. So it's not like they can be analogous of, of the shrimps at any given time. So that was the ecosystem processes uh, part of the dams. Now I wanna move into more uh, the exotic invasive species portion. So when you go uh, around walking in the reservoirs, you see uh, some scenes like this one. So this is right off the shores in, in the Guayabal Reservoir in Juana Diaz and other in the South Central part of the island. And this guy right here is uh, an aquarium cleaner. So the classic uh, selfie plecos that they sell to, for you to put in your aquarium so they can like stick to the wall and then just like constantly graze the algae that grows to keep your aquarium clean. Well, some of these guys actually grow and keep growing and people don't like them when they're like really big in their aquarium. So instead of killing them or flushing them down the toilet, they go to their nearest reservoir and dump them. And now they have become like basically like a very established exotic population in, in dams and rivers around Puerto Rico. And the other one, I'm sorry about this picture because like I'm really bad at taking field pictures, but you have to trust me on this one that within these circles, there's like two orange spots. And this is basically in the same, you can see the pleco here. These are red devils. So these are like introduced cichlids who are also becoming established in these reservoirs. And it makes sense because these are the reservoirs that are basically excluding most of the natural uh, of the native fauna. So this is like prime habitat for them to get established and reach high population numbers. So it's very common to see uh, these accidentally or uh, intentional introduced species alongside the other uh, commonly stuck uh, like largemouth bass for recreation in in some of these habitats. And going back to that study that I mentioned before, uh, the home quiz that described the, the shrimp populations and the difference between dams with spillway and without spillway, uh, home quiz also noticed that regardless of spillway or not spillway, exotic fishes were present in higher abundance in, in these sites. So dams have been facilitated the introduction and the establishment of most of these species. But one of the really cool studies most recently was uh, done by Cooney and colleagues. They basically went all around the island looking at any type of fish barrier, including large dams, which are my uh, particular interest for my research, medium-sized dams with constant spillway, flood control, smaller dams, bridge crossings with like underwater uh, under structures, small head dams, and even natural waterfalls. So they were really interested in how any sort of blockage 
within the channel network will influence the fish community, mainly looking at, at native fish populations. And they have a very extensive data set, over a hundred sites all across the island. But what I wanted to highlight from their findings was this particular uh, diagram. So, so they basically split the different barriers based on height. And these are the dams that we're interested in, like all the very large dams. No native species whatsoever above them. All the fish community, as soon as you hit a dam higher than 32 meters was completely exotic. There was also a threshold of dams between 32, which is the large dams and four meters, which are the most smaller constant flowing dams. The only native fishes were gobies. So gobies are the ones who have the pelvic fin acting as a suction cup. So they can actually climb most of these barriers and reach up. But every time you have like a large dam, not even the gobies can make it. So this is kind of like the same trend that the fish, uh, that the native streams also follow. So dams with spillway, any connectivity they can climb, they'll be there. Anything big, they won't be there. So we're having the same trend with the fishes. But I'm not interested in fishes yet. Uh, the rest of the story for now will be focused on the Australian red claw. So this is uh, an invasive crayfish that was actually detected for the first time. The first recorded intro introduction happened in 1998 in the Rio Grande de Loisa watershed. So in 98 was uh, the Hurricane George's year. It was the biggest hurricane before uh, Maria in 2017. There was an aquaculture facility that flooded and a lot of these individuals made their way into the uh, Rio Grande de Loisa watershed and they became established, particularly in the, in the Caraiso Reservoir. After that, a second introduction happened in the west side of the island uh, from a research facility. So there were two introductions uh, between 1998 and 2001. But most recently, uh, my colleague Nick Macias uh, published his master thesis in which he went all around the island trapping, trying to establish the, the distribution of these, of these individuals. And he found that they were actually expanding beyond their initial introduction range. And no surprisingly, these are very popular with the, with the, fish, uh, the fishermen community in Puerto Rico, because these are like large, tasty uh, decapods that can be cooked and uh, fishermen love them. And they're actually probably the ones who are spraying them around. So fast forward to uh, 10 years, I was chatting with uh, some of my colleagues and, and we found out that there was a research group in Martinique who, who also had the, the Cherax problem. They were like tracking the introduction of the Australian red claw and they actually use environmental DNA to, to determine their presence and absence. So I was intrigued. This was a, a good opportunity to use a, a modern tool to, to establish the, the introduction status for most of these crayfish. And, and talking with some of my colleagues, we decided to give it a go. And a few months ago, uh, me and Nick went to Puerto Rico. Uh, we drove around for three days and we sampled 14 reservoirs for environmental DNA to determine whether or not uh, these crayfish were expanding beyond the range that, that Nick had originally uh, published back in, in 2021. So the way that environmental DNA works is like, if the species is present in that medium, in this case, the medium will be the reservoir, they're disturbing some of their tissues coming out, they're pooping, they're like basically releasing uh, DNA into the environment. So we don't really need to catch them. We don't really need to see them in order to determine whether it, they're there. So. Uh, that was a time-saving opportunity also to, to start monitoring these guys uh, at a more frequent uh, pace because trapping takes some time. Uh, just going back, this is Nick probably setting up a trap. So you have to set up the traps, bait them, wait till the next day, then come back, pull them out just to see if they're there. When we're doing environmental DNA, all we did was we went to our study sites with this 
Home Depot improvised sampler. So it's a painting tube with a bottle attached at the end. We collect three liters of water from every site that we visit. We close the liter of water. We uh, take some environmental readings of the sites that we sample. After that, we go back to either the lab or a hotel room and we filter the three liters of water into three different filters. We preserve them using DNA buffers. Then after that, I'll take them back to, to Massachusetts to my lab at Holy Cross where we extract the DNA, we quantify the DNA, and then we run real-time PCR to determine whether or not the, the, the Cherax are located in those habitats or not. So at last, that, that's at the stage we're at. We also can quantify how much DNA uh, we get from, from the samples that we filter. So these are the very preliminary first run incomplete results, but thus far we've been hitting positive uh, eDNA presence in the sites in which Nick uh, was able to find them physically. On top of that, we have located, uh, we have identified three more, three new sites in which they are present. So this is the extent of our sampling trip during Easter. The red flags here represents the sites in which uh, the Cherax is present. The blue flags are the reservoirs that we sample in which the eDNA did not uh, have any signal for the Cherax. And in order to control to make sure that, that our water samples and our DNA was actually hidden for the species that we were looking for, the Australian Red Club, we went to the Caribes Fisheries, which is a basically an aquaculture facility that sells ornamental fishes in which some of the initial, uh, the second introduction on the west side of the island, individuals actually made their way there. And the owner of this facility keeps a tank. So every time he finds one, he just like tries to take it away from, from his actual tanks and, and keeps them around. So we visited them. Uh, we were able to sample the tanks in which these are present and we run everything, uh, all the DNA extraction and the DNA quantification. And this is a site that we use to, to make sure we're hitting uh, the right signals. But as you can see, just from the extent of the red flags, with the initial introduction being here, it's obviously that these guys are moving around. And most of the time, they're not moving by themselves. One of the most interesting things that we found during this trip was talking to fishermen. Uh, when we told them uh, basically what we were doing, looking for, for the langostino, the crayfish, uh, we heard stories like, yeah, my cousin lives in the, near this lake and they have them. He was gonna give me a bucket for me to dump on my lake. And, and that gave us basically an indication of how, how these things are, are getting established. So the next steps for this project is uh, we're going back in September. So I'm taking some of my students and other collaborators. We're going back and the idea is to complete uh, the sampling location, uh, all the sampling of the reservoirs that we haven't been able to hit. There's still 12 dams that we haven't uh, been able to sample and also start increasing the sample, uh, the spatial extent of the sample. During the Easter trip, we only sampled three points, uh, three bottles in a single point. So hopefully we'll have time in September to go to a lake and actually like sample different locations just to see how the eDNA signal changes across the spatial. Uh, location. Then in April, uh, we're going to conduct intensive eDNA and physical sample in, in the Guayabal and Tobacco site. So these are two reservoirs that are side by side, and one of them has an active spillway discharge that allows for shrimp migration, and the other one is a completely uh, dam, no spillway, no connection dam, because one of the interesting parts of this story is that every single red flag here is a dam that has no connection whatsoever. The other dams either have a control gate that has been open recently or have a free crest spillway discharge that allow for shrimp migration. So what we're pointing into and the early evidence suggests that there's some biotic resistance by the shrimp communities that are actually making it above them, preventing this uh, invasive crayfish to getting established. That's our working hypothesis right now. That's why we wanted to go 
to the Guayabal and Tobacco sites next year, because if they're getting introduced in Tobacco and Tobacco was actually the site with the, with the highest signal uh, from this trip, it's very likely that the same fishermen are also using Guayabal and they're actually either dumping them or accidentally dropping them in those sites. So, so if there's some biotic resistance, we'll be able to, to get more solid evidence by sampling these two sites intensively both using environmental DNA and, and trapping. So uh, just as a quick summary conclude, the extirpation of shrimps definitely creating huge differences when it comes down to ecosystem processes and community structure. So uh, as a result of being extirpated by, by dams and those extirpations happen in most cases over 40 years ago. So the big boom, the, the highest a number of dams were actually built around the 70s. And up to this point, there hasn't been a, an assemblage that has been able to take over and, and provide the roles that the shrimp provide in this ecosystem. So it's really interesting that, that there hasn't been, there's not a case of actual functional redundancy yet. And also the early evidence from, from environmental DNA, uh, obviously showing us that the invasives are being spread. So not only the, the lack of ecosystem function from, from the shrimp absence, but now we have these new threats that, <clears throat> that we're not exactly sure how they're gonna affect the, the headwater streams where it's basically where most of the shrimps are, are normally located and, and creating the role. And there's also evidence that the extirpation of shrimps is actually facilitating the spread and the invasion of these crayfish. So, so we're excited, we're really excited about this project and, and we can wait to, to tell you more once we, we get all the, the reservoirs and we start looking more into this potential biotic resistance hypothesis. And with that, I wanna say thanks to my collaborators over the years from all the way back to, to grad school, new collaborators and funding sources. And if there's any question, please feel free to contact me anytime or I think we have time. I promise Anita that I'll keep it under 45. So hopefully that's the case. Thank you, PJ. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, so I kind of did have a question for you. Um, a, first of all, I really enjoyed uh, listening to the research that you've been doing and definitely getting to know a little bit more about Puerto Rico's ecosystems. Um, so I know you've like you've kind of mentioned like you know like mans that don't have any connectivity to like the um, the streams downstream. Uh, you're not seeing any shrimp. Um, so like with this research uh, showing how important these shrimps are with coming like you know like the ecosystem services. Um, is there like a path to be able to uh, like modify the dam so they could have like some sort of, sort of flow so the shrimp could be able to access like the upstream of it. Uh, that's what we always kind of like expected from this, but, uh, the, the main problem is that since most of these are for water supply, basically water flowing over represents money being lost for the, uh, for the water authority. So, so it's going to be very hard to convince because even the dams that have no connection whatsoever, there's still a gate. And they were actually, most of them were open back in 2017 during Hurricane Maria when they were about to flood. But even during that moment, the pressure was so high that there was like, it was impossible for anything to actually go up. So ideally you will think that, yeah, it, it's obviously that we're showing that all you need is a little bit of connectivity. You don't even need to dump a bunch of like gallons per minute. You just need like some sort of trail for them to go up. But, so far, we've been unsuccessful into convincing uh, reservoir managers and owner to to do that kind of thing. And obviously, the the more ideal solutions such as fish ladder or off channel uh, passages, uh, those are way too expensive. Uh, we in Puerto Rico, we, we don't have that kind of money yet. Got it. Uh, the other question that I have was uh, with the crayfish. Obviously, you're using the eDNA samples to be able to determine the presence or absence of them. Yep. Um, but is there like a way to determine like how like the abundance of them? Is that something that you guys are maybe potentially looking into? Like, yeah, you know that they're there, but you know, 
the abundance could be very low or very high? Like, is that something that you guys are thinking of looking into? Yes, uh, we actually, uh, with the real-time PCR, we can actually quantify the, the amount of, of DNA copies that are in the sample. And, and that's basically what I'm doing as soon as the semester starts again uh, next month, is trying to work a little bit more with uh, the, the positive control samples to perfect the, the standard curve so we can tell uh, how many DNA copies of the Cherax are present. And on top of that, we actually want to, to reaffirm that with actual empirical data by going into the April 2024 trip in which we're going to be collecting physical samples so we can connect and, and link actual densities of, of the crayfish from traps to DNA samples collected at the very same spot on this very same day. So, so yes, there's a way. We're still working on it. Hopefully get there by, by summer next year. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Chaco does have a question for you on the chat. He says, uh, how many potential dams and in what parts of the islands are yet left unsampled? Uh, we sample most of the northeastern side, uh, but pretty much the, the ones that are left, there's 12 and they're pretty much all over the place mainly in the in, up in the mountains actually two sites that one we never found the dam even though like we were right next to it on the map and the other one we we got lost and we almost lost the the actual rental car so 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 they're yeah check out they're pretty much all over the island so, so it's gonna be another huge road trip okay any other questions for PJ? You could either, you know, unmute or put it on the chat. So I'm kind of curious, how did you almost lose the rental car? We started going into a very, very steep, tiny road that get, kept getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And we reach a point in which like we actually couldn't like go up like the car didn't have enough power to go up. we actually needed an all-wheel drive to get there but yeah, those are things that happen when when you trust uh google maps yeah um so someone on the chat says uh have you sampled in maya get maya guess hopefully yeah not yet, uh, but Maya West is, is one of our uh, future destinations when we start sampling uh, non dam streams too. So we actually want to go back to Guanajibo and Sabra Grande and, and start sampling all that region. Because ideally, uh, once we wrap up the dams, we can actually go into the on dam streams. Because uh, just going back to, to the study that I referenced from Martinique, uh, they are just sampling rivers and they're finding them in rivers. And this, this species actually in their natural range in Australia is a river species. So that's kind of like the other hint that, that the absence of shrimps might be what is driving their, their establishment and facilitating their establishment. So if DNA wasn't so expensive, I would have like sampled some of the streams as we were driving around, but, but we were limited on budget. So hopefully that happens soon. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, Checo is saying, uh, what about the connection of this Puerto Rico's subpopulations of Cherax to other populations of Red Claws worldwide? Um, do you know if this is any genetic relationships that can be linked to the initial or multiple introduction? For example, can we tell if there is diverse population established? Perhaps a question for Nick M. <laughs> he, he, he got it right on that. And um, I know uh, Nick, uh, for his master's thesis on top of like doing the physical sampling and going around the island, he was collecting individuals. And he was like uh, basically looking at the genetic diversity of the different individuals that he collected. And we also collected some tissue from, from the individuals that we found in, in this Easter trip. 
Now, what he's doing with that, I haven't got there yet, but hopefully he'll have some results to share with all of us soon enough. And then someone else asked, um, have you found another species of crawfish in the island? Not yet. Uh, that might be another question for Nick, because he was pulling traps. Uh, since we were just looking for the environmental DNA from our samples, basically every time we, we run the reactions, it was just going to tell us about these one species that we're interested in. But luckily, uh, to my knowledge, that's the, the, other, the only other one that has been found. Okay. Got it. Also, hi, Nick. I wasn't sure if that was you. <laughs> Um, does anyone, anyone else have any further questions? Uh, Checo says, have you found shrimp in traps slash places with Chirax? What about my, my micro brachurium? Probably saying that wrong. Micro raccoons. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, th those are the... The, the big shrimps with the claws that, that closely resemble uh, a crayfish. Uh, there are some, some populations, uh, sometimes there are shrimps in Caraiso since uh, sometimes that's a passive spillway. So you have like some flow and, and some stragglers actually make it out there. There's some standard populations. So, so there's a little bit of overlap. There's an indication of a little bit of overlap. Uh, the permanent sites in which like there's always a spillway I check all the ones and those were like all hitting negative for us so it seems that it, it'll be more on the on the steadiness or or, or or how constant the shrimp populations are there or not Uh, last question from Checo. Uh, can we convince can we convince Anita to come sampling crayfish in Puerto Rico with us? Uh, well, if you guys could find funny for me, definitely. Uh, I'll definitely be up for it. <laughs> yes. Anita, October, October and April, twenty twenty four. Now you know, it's happening. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm putting my calendar. Gotta, yep. you know, help pay for. For the trip, then yes. <laughs> Check out got that bean money. <laughs> He's rolling in the dough. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there is no further questions for PJ, um, last round. If not, uh, thank you very much for you guys for attending uh, this month's expert series talk. Um, I hope you guys got to learn a little bit more about uh, Puerto Rico, as well as uh, the dams and the fauna and the ecosystems of Puerto Rico, uh, which is pretty cool, you know. Um, and I hope that you guys get to come and watch our next expert series talks for next month, which is going to be Nick Macias, who is on this uh, Zoom call as well. Um, can't tell you what his topic is yet because I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, I really hope you guys got to enjoy it and hopefully you guys got to um, got to as well. And thank you again, PJ, uh, for doing this talk. I really appreciate it. I definitely learned a lot more. Um, and hopefully I get to see you soon in October. You know, Sacnas, Puerto Rico, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah, anytime. Thank you for having me, guys. You're welcome and thanks you guys. <laughs>